Mr. Hackett, a native of Massachusetts, received his bachelor's degree from Boston University, from Boston College, and did graduate work at New York University and the University of South Carolina. After graduation, he joined the Peace Corps and served in Ghana. Then he joined the Catholic Relief Services and has been with them since, serving under various capacities. His first assignment was in Sierra Leone as program director, then returned to New York to serve as development assistant and later development director for the African region. In 1985, Mr. Hackett was named director of external affairs. In 1987, country representative in the Philippines. And in 1992, regional director for East Africa. Mr. Hackett was named Executive Director for Catholic Relief Services in July of 1993. He also agreed to serve on our Board of Trustees. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Hackett to the Council. Thank you very much. It's uh, truly a pleasure to be here. I'm rather a newcomer to Baltimore and to Maryland. Uh, as was mentioned, I, I was just appointed a little over a year ago. And in the last year, I've been traveling quite a bit. Tonight's uh, presentation is on issues in Rwanda and Burundi, in Central Africa. Rwanda, as you know, is maybe page four in the sun. And its passion and its imagery and horror have started to recede from our consciousness. In fact, I think you'd be hard pressed to find an article on Rwanda in the New York Times or the Post uh, or the Sun. Sun still carries a little bit. But uh, certainly on Burundi, there was one article, I watched the situation rather closely, in the Sun over the last uh, month. But maybe as events recede from the limelight, uh, one can reflect upon their ramifications with greater objectivity. I've been visiting Rwanda and Burundi on and off for about 20 years. I've witnessed the slow economic growth, the onset of AIDS, the coups, the massacres, and also some very positive steps towards democracy taking hold in Burundi. Then over the last 11 months, I watched the conflagration ravage both countries. What I'd like to discuss tonight is some different approaches that we are trying to take and other groups are trying to take to address those problems. But let me first trace back the history of the problems in these two countries. And as many of you know, the history is linked. Some of the genesis of the problem in Central Africa started back, according to many, at the Berlin Conference in 1884, when most of Africa was divided up by the European powers. Those who attribute the problems to that point in time contend that the arbitrariness of the European division of borders left permanent scars on the psyches of the people of Rwanda and Burundi. I don't particularly buy that line, but others have a different explanation. They have a group of Hamitic people and you probably read this, migrating down into the lakes region of Central Africa in around the 16th century. I think the Sun did an article on, on this uh, particular uh, school of thought uh, back in uh, May. This approach has uh, this Hamitic group of people absorbing the local language and developing a monarchy in this particular central part of Africa, the Lakes region as it's called. In Burundi, 
And remember, the two countries were linked at this time. Well, they weren't countries at this time. They were just areas. But society in Burundi, and to a similar extent in Rwanda, Rwanda <clears throat> was stratified into classes. Those classes had a monarchy group called the Ganwa, the politician or the, a secondary group called the Tutsi, who were also cattle her herders, a third group called the Hutu, who were the cultivators, the farmers, and a fourth group called the Twa, or what's now called the Pygmies. They were the potters and the dancers and the entertainers. There is, in my research, in the research of the people who have worked with me there in Rwanda and Burundi, a lot of debate in the literature among the anthropologists about whether there's any genetic distinction at all between Hutus and Tutsis. But let me explain what occurred in the 16th and 17th centuries and then, then later on. There was kind of a defining period, as we know it in current history, in the 20s and the 30s, when the Belgians classified everybody in Burundi and in Rwanda into three distinct races, not four. They lumped the Tutsi Ganwa. They were the politicians' monarchy, then Hutus and Twa. They made that distinction as they approached the colonial period. Then, in... Um, 1934, they went even further. They started to classify all the people in the country by how many cows they owned. <laughs> if you owned 10 cows, you automatically became a Tutsi. If you were a Tutsi and you didn't own 10 cows, you were a Hutu. <laughs> it sounds pretty foolish, but one researcher, Karen Watson, <clears throat> uh, talks about this particular period. She says, at this point in time, Hutu-ness became even more associated with poverty and powerlessness. So this whole question of whether you're a Hutu and a Tutsi that is being debated now as, as an ethnic struggle or what is it, I mean, there is quite a bit of debate whether it has anything to do with ethnicity at all. And in our opinion, uh, it doesn't. It has to do with class and it has to do with uh, this blurring of the situation. In fact, you could blur the situation whether you're a Hutu and a Tutsi as late as February of last year. You can go out on the street and buy a card and everybody in Rwanda and everybody in Burundi carries an identity card and you could buy your Tutsi identity. And you could buy your Hutu identity if you happen to live in Rwanda, which was a superior thing to be, to be. So those who present the immediate crisis, which has meant the murders of close to 500,000 in Rwanda and another 200,000 in Burundi during the last 12 months, as simply an ethnic clash between Hutus and Tutsis, are, are presenting it in an overly simplistic way. There is nothing simple in our understanding of what is going on in Rwanda and Burundi. Everything I can see that is happening in those country, those two countries points to a long history of te tension, a history that's fueled by class struggle, aggravated by colonial convenience, and fermented by a desire on many people's part to hold on to power, and a desire to hold on to that power by instilling kind of an insidious fear let me jump a little bit to a period over the last three decades and talk a little bit about uh, both countries and what happened in the recent memory of the people who live there now. <clears throat> in 1959, independence came to Rwanda after a violent uprising of Hutus against Tutsis. Some contend that the uprising was abetted by the Belgians. I don't know. Uh, I've heard both sides of the picture. But the monarchy was overthrown, the monarchy that was started back in the 16th century. Thousands of Tutsis were slaughtered in Rwanda. Tens of thousands of those uh, Tutsis fled into Uganda and into Burundi and Tanzania and Zaire. In Burundi about the same time, there was not a violent uprising at the period of independence, but there was that, that Ganwe Tutsi group 
that was controlling things that split into two. Once one group was led by the prince, Prince Ragasura, who took over what is called the Uprona party, which exists as of today. Another group, the Christian Democrats, was dominated by another section of the Tutsis. The Uprona party controlled things at independence and controlled it pretty well. The prince basically balanced the Hutu Tutsi issue. He placed the Hutu in as party president. But as things go in this part of the world, in 61, the prince was assassinated. With the prince, who was seen as a moderate off the scene, the tension started to boil again. And those who wanted to sow the fear and the, and the dread started to uh, stimulate those tensions. A period of violence and vying for power came in about 1962. And there were some heavy massacres spotted around both of these countries, but particularly in Burundi. In 66, President Michumbero, a name that might be familiar to some of you, a southern Tutsi, came into power. He had a, a low-level coup d'etat. Again, periodic massacres spotted around the country between Hutus and Tutsis, but nothing so violent until 1972. And Ambassador Tom Mulady, who some of you may know or recall, has written a, a small book about that period, 1972, which is called The Events. It was, in recent memory, or such, uh, since the Second World War and the Holocaust, probably the worst massacre in the world. Most estimate, including the CRS, the Catholic Relief Services staff who were there at the time, that within the first week, 50,000 people were killed. Some claim that there was a plan to exterminate the Hutu peril by this elite group of Tutsis who were in control. Others claim that everything was sparked by a, a uh, infiltration from Tanzania of Hutus who had been sent out and settled in Tanzania previously. I don't know. Uh, and Ambassador Tom Mulady doesn't know. And if you talk to a Hutu historian, he gives you one point of view. If you talk to a uh, Tutsi historian, he gives you another. But what we do know, and has been well documented, is that after that first week, when there was so much killing in 1972, that Radio Burundi started to incite this retaliatory spirit. There were documented reports where the radio, now it's controlled by Tutsi-dominated government, came out with statements like, hunt down your enemy, be united, exterminate once and for all the enemy. And Tutsi set about massacring Hutus in Burundi with wanton abandon. They wiped out all Hutus who had any education that could be found. So in Bujumbura, and I was there in 75, you couldn't find anybody with more than a third grade education in 1975, if they were Hutu. It was clear, it was premeditated, and it was, it was terrible. Again, Hutus fled the country, many to Rwanda. <clears throat> and by 75, or even 1973, there was no Hutu educated class in Burundi. The, ec the economy started to deteriorate. Now you had nobody to do the work. You had a lot of elite people, Tutsis. Uh, and things generally deteriorated. So, Michimbera was overthrown in a bloodless coup. And his deputy chief of staff, uh, Jean-Baptiste Bagaza, took over. Bagaza was kind of a ruthless fellow, but there was no major ethnic turmoil. Uh, between 76 and 87. Things were quiet because he ruled with an iron fist. He was one of those African status type of rulers who nationalized all of the, uh, the land, took over the schools from the churches, took over the businesses from the Belgium, French, and Greek commerçants. It was that that era of the 70s when uh, people like Mengistu and, and others were around. He, Bagaza, was again deposed by a bloodless coup 
by another group of Army officers. This time, a Southern Tutsi by the name of Major Pierre Bioya was installed as president. His administration was pretty benign. Um, and he did some really far-sighted things. But what had been let loose under um, his predecessors kind of filtered into the countryside. So there were many incidents in the countryside in Burundi of violent turmoil and, and localized massacres, which, which Boyoya, as a benign president, didn't put down as hard as some of his predecessors had. Again, you had the situation of Tutsis running out of the country when the Hutus were undertaking the massacre, Hutus running out of the country when it was a, a Tutsi massacre. So you've got a situation, I think I've, I've conveyed to you, where you've got people moving out of these countries continually over a, spe uh, a span of about 60 years. But Bayoya did something uh, truly unique in uh, Burundi. On June of, of uh, 1993, he held a, what's considered by most uh, Africanists as a classic democratic election. And power passed from his party, which was a Tutsu-dominated party, to a Hutu-dominated party. There was a 97% voter turnout. Election monitors were all over the place. The National Democratic Institute's people who were financed by USAID to observe and organize the election were besi beside themselves with euphoria. This was Africa's cleanest, best, ideal African election. And I felt the same way. I was sitting in Nairobi at the time and was on the phone two or three times a day to our people in Bujumbura. And, you know, there was a little skirmish here or a little skirmish there, but this worked out nicely. We had now a majority Hutu party take over. And a military dominated Tutsi party stepped down. It worked. <laughs> but it was very short lived. The last event on the Burundi side of the border that I'll talk to about in detail is the sad sequel to that election of June 93. In October of last year, just about this time, a small group of um, disaffected Tutsi military officers who were discontent with the speed at which this Hutu government started to appoint local governors and other, uh, other Hutu officials into key posts. They shot and killed President Ndadai. Again, there was another unleashing of a period of violence, massacre, and reprisal. And this time last year, something in the range of 200,000 people were killed in Burundi. The week before last, last Thursday, a government was again formed in Burundi. Like its immediate predecessor, it attempts to, to balance the ethnicity question. How long it will last, I don't know. I probably don't need in covering Rwanda to go into the same level of concern. You've read about the invasion of the RPF. You've read about the shooting down of the presidents that started the turmoil in April. You've read probably about the peace talks that led up to the turmoil. You've heard about the militia, the so-called interhamwe that has gone around in the refugee camps killing people and stirring up uh, violence. And you're probably quite aware of the refugee numbers that are outside the country, which now we estimate to be about a million and a half living outside of Rwanda. About three million are displaced inside as I drove last month from the southern part of Rwanda to the north, there are places where normally you would see hundreds of people tilling uh, their land at that particular time of the year. There's nobody. They're ghost towns. And then there are other places where you see encampments and people just displaced and uh, settled around a particular area just for safety. What we're witnessing in Rwanda and Burundi today is, as I said, an insidious pattern of violence and power struggle. And it's a struggle that's played itself out in massacre and genocide. A conflict which has perceived ethnic, social, class, and power elephants. 
It dominates the history of both countries, and every child, in, whether they be Hutu or Tutsi in Rwanda or Burundi, can give you the tales of all that history. My point in raising all of this tonight is not to uh, flavor my presentation with these terrible tales of, of terror and trauma. Rather, I'd like to offer and share with you the challenge that Catholic Relief Services, our organization, is facing in trying to deal with this type of situation, a situation that we've been involved in in 30 years. I mean, we're asking ourselves how long this pattern of violence that seems to have been going on for almost 100 years, or maybe longer, will continue. And how do you get the people in Rwanda and Burundi to heal their wounds? How do you get them to live together? How can I live together with you if you killed my son? I mean, what, what is going to lead to a healing process, and who can lead those efforts? In our view, these are the most important issues to address before we can consider the rebuilding of the economies, of the nations, of democracy. These are the issues to, ha to be addressed. And no doubt when the scholars and the historians research the current genocide in Rwanda, they will document a long history of events fed by a very conscious and planned program to build hatred. They may well document the use of government resources to support that campaign. At the very least, they will show that the Rwandan government apparatus, which our tax dollars supported in its economic development activity, was used to stimulate that effort. Our tax dollars attempted to coax the Rwandan government into taking steps towards a more pluralistic and democratic society. Those same mechanisms were used by that government to spread violence. And it will also show, if we look at what historians will probably write, that the development community, which Catholic Relief Services and many other agencies are part of, failed. We failed in any effective way to halt this clear pattern of violence and hatred. My contention is that unless and until these two countries can reconcile their people, until they can diminish the fear that's been created over decades, they can't establish democratic society and we shouldn't try. In a recent book put out by the Center for Strategic and International Studies called Religion, the Missing Dimension of Statecraft, the editors Doug Johnson and Cynthia Sampson seem to place some of the blame for situations like those in Rwanda and Burundi, on diplomats. I'm sorry if any of you are diplomats, but they wrote the book. They contend, as have others, that many of the conflicts we're now seeing in the world, the Bosnian crisis, the Southern Sudan War, the continuing Cambodia conflict, the Central Africa conflagration, spring from different kind of roots than the Cold War ideologies. I was with Doug Johnson on Friday at a luncheon down in Washington, and I asked him to give me a quick synopsis on the book, and, and he said something like this. <clears throat> the premise of his book is that what is required is no longer a shrewd understanding of the interests of both parties, which can be explained to diplomats by other Ivy League diplomats. The Ivy League diplomats, the trained guys who have been through the same universities that we have all been and can relate in the same argot that, that diplomats do. Rather, what is needed for these new type of conflicts is an un understanding of the emotional issues, the emotional stakes that are involved. And these are best understood through a deeper appreciation of the history, the cultures, the issues of justice, the social divisions, and the perceived injustices, not the actual injustices, the perceived injustices. He contends that it is often individuals outside the traditional domain of diplomacy that can not only explain the nature of the conflict, but more importantly, such individuals, such as religious leaders or individuals inspired by a spiritual perspective on the situation, can and have played pivotal roles in mediating such conflicts. He posits that the conflicts of the future are less amenable to traditional diplomatic compromise because they are, and will 
likely continue to be charged by more ethnic, religious, and nationalistic motives than the conflicts of the past, which were characterized by power politics and tangible material interests. In the world of my agency, Catholic Relief Services, we're deeply entwined with these conflicts of an ethnic, national, or religious nature. Over the weekend of September 17th, my three deputies and I held our cellular phones like in our pockets on the golf course and everywhere else because we were prepared on that weekend to evacuate out of Sarajevo, Angola, Bujumbura, Kigali, Monrovia, Liberia, and Port-au-Prince. This was the day before the invasion. I mean, it was the worst situation we've ever faced in our 20 years. <clears throat> we've, we've never had that many or that array of conflictive situations facing us in the world. Happily, we only evacuated out of uh, Angola. Well, we didn't evacuate totally out of Angola from Huambo down, and we put our people back in. But this array of conflictive situations has raised for us a completely new dimension to our work. We now see that our traditional working paradigm to move our assistance through kind of a continuum from relief to rehabilitation to longer term development, as we've attempted in Rwanda and Burundi so many times in the past, is patently inadequate. We now realize that if we are not consciously engaged in a process that integrates reconciliation into all aspects of our work, nothing lasting is going to be accomplished. We've responded to multiple crises in Rwanda and Burundi over 30 years of our history. What we've continually failed to add to our efforts is that process of reconciliation. We gave it lip service, but we never placed it as integral to any of our efforts, nor did anybody else. But in this recognition, we now realize that as external agents, whether we be CRS, USAID, World Bank, or the UN agents, agencies, none of us as external agencies can bring about the reconciliation that's needed. Reconciliation in these contexts is a very personal process. We've got to forgive each other. And there's only certain people who, in a way, have the moral authority to call for that reconciliation, as we've seen in Brazil during the, the torture and the terror, as we saw in El Salvador, as we saw in so many places around the country. One writer on the topic who identifies in his study of many Latin American countries what reconciliation is, he calls it a fundamental repair to human lives, especially the lives of those who have suffered. So what can we, as external agencies, do about a fundamental repair? When I was meeting with the Rwandan president, Bizimungu, last month, or in uh, September, he was kind of passing messages because a lot of dialogue isn't happening yet. And he said, you're meeting with the Catholic bishops. This is a country that's 85 percent Catholic. The Catholic bishops must call for reconciliation. He thought we'd march down and tell them to call for reconciliation. <laughs> We did march down to, to meet with the bishops. There were three. Overall, there had been nine bishops. Three had been killed. Three were outside the country. There were three left in the country. But the Catholic bishops in Rwanda and most other church leaders, Anglican, Presbyterian, Episcopalian, they are not ready for reconciliation. And they cannot, as institutional representatives, call for that reconciliation. For the most part, the church leaders were too closely entwined with all of the problems that went on. And also, they're terribly traumatized. We have active as external assistance actors. We, as active external assistance actors, are undertaking a deep process of reflection. At the very least, we've got to look at the manner in which we undertake our relief activities to make sure that we're not creating blockages to reconciliation. We now accept that injustice and trauma caused by a pattern of violence is not healed by simply putting the same structures of government efficiently back into the same molds as they were before. We must engage and support actions of a range of people who heretofore may not have been factored into the process of conflict uh, resolution. 
In Rwanda, we realized that while we would continue to provide food assistance to the displaced, we must begin to deal with the more vexing issues of how communities can live next to each other and how people can live next to each other. And we cannot just go back with our relief or our rehabilitation assistance and blindly reestablish the status quo of before. We realize that there are problems of land, there's fears of reprisals, there's personal hatred, and these are not eliminated by a few human rights monitors or by any immediate measures that are being talked about now for as part of short-term packages. It's going to take years and patience and a variety of large and small efforts to deal with the problems of these countries. Last week we had a group of nine African bishops, all of whom were somehow engaged in conflict resolution. They came together at Duquesne. And they were there to just reflect on the process of conflict resolution and reconciliation. Every one of them was an integral actor out of the mainstream in one of those processes. Bishop Gonsalves from Mozambique, who put together the Renamo for Limo package. A bishop from Benin, Burundi, Liberia, Nigeria, South Africa, and Zimbabwe. Every one of them involved somehow. And we brought them together to share their experience. They're non-traditional actors. Many of them, in fact, I had four of them in the office this afternoon sharing their experience with us, reinforced this position of their non-traditional role in terms of the normal diplomatic statehood, statecraft way of doing things. Two of them, one from Zimbabwe and Gonsalves from Mozambique, talked about their initial efforts, which were shunned by the diplomatic community. Ah, you're not a diplomat, you don't know. And those were the guys that put the package together. What I leave you with is the observation that the Marshall Plan type of packages for nations of Central Africa or for Bosnia or for Cambodia or probably even for Haiti, I don't know what Larry said last week, or many of the other seemingly intractable conflicts of our day are just not going to fit. The state-based diplomatic or foreign aid solutions that we've applied in the past are not going to be adequate. We've got to look at new diplomatic paradigms for peace, just as we look for new diplomatic paradigms for humanitarian and economic assistance. We've got to teach our diplomats, just like I try to teach my staff, that they should not only be looking in the halls of the Department of Foreign Affairs or in the National Bank for their solutions. Because oftentimes that level of person doesn't carry the emotional, historical baggage that somebody who is really going to get into a reconciliation process or a conflict resolution process may need to carry. It's not in the language of statecraft or economic models, and it's not in the transplanted models of Jeffersonian democracy that the lasting solutions in some of these countries is going to be found. It may well be in the solutions that flow from a mullah or a bishop or an individual with a lot of charisma and feeling who live very deeply in the passion and the emotions that underlie the problems in the countries that are having these conflicts. If we search, the right individuals will surface. If we're smart, we can help them reach for peace. Thank you very much. The, que the question is, isn't uh, the statement that, that the people in Rwanda are 80 percent Catholic a, a misnomer and a, a conveying the situation correctly? Yes, of course. I mean, um, the, Catholics, the Catholics add things up, you know, and once you've got baptism and First Communion, you're a Catholic, boom. You have your I am a Catholic card. Uh, but uh, I think the issue is much more profound and deep than that. And there are many, many people struggling with this issue of how can this good church-going Catholic or church-going Anglican or Presbyterian have participated. Now, at the same time, when we talk in this situation about the terrible things that people did, including clergy, we also have to talk about the heroes and the people who gave their life, and there are a lot of them. 
And some who, who are thinking about reconciliation very deeply are saying the most important thing for Rwanda and Burundi in these type of situations is to capture those stories, the stories, the Schindler stories, because that can bring people some pride. But if you watched or you allowed in some way those Tutsi kids who lived next door and played with your kids to be killed, or you pointed when the Interhamway came and said, where are the Tutsi kids? I'm going to kill you if you don't tell me. And you said, they're there. How are you going to live with yourself? That's the terrible problem. And then all of a sudden, two years from now, you're supposed to vote in an election. and it get, uh, You've got to deal with those personal crises. The question is the, the rise of strong leaders within the Rwandan Burundi context. President Boyoya, as a Tutsi in Burundi, was courageous. I mean, they tried to take him down so often in the last three years prior to election. It was, it was amazing. But he stood up. He says, I am a southern Tutsi from Bururi. That is where the kings came from. I have a tradition of ruling in this country. And I am going to go through a democratic election process and hand power to whoever wins. And when the Hutu party won, he handed process. Now, he's still there. And it's those kind of people who can rise up. The, the Catholic bishop of Bujumbura is an extremely intelligent, courageous Hutu who engages with his brother bishops who are, for the most part, Tutsi, and lays the cards on the table. There's, uh, there's some uh, Anglican uh, bishops in both countries who are saying the right things and doing the right things. Um, and there could be some leaders that, that I don't know that will surface. I think we've got to search for those kind of people and not just say, because they don't dress in the same way, because they can't articulate the statecraft in the same way, we're not really going to talk to them. We've got to find the people who are sloppier and not quite as clear, but who have the trust of people around them and who, who know where the so-called bodies are buried, what, what moves people. I think we can find those with, if we look seriously. Actually, the American ambassador in Rwanda is a terrific individual who is, uh, he grew up as a missionary child in Burundi, speaks fluent Kurundi. Kurundi and Kinyi Rwanda, the language of Rwanda, are similar. It's like Boston to Baltimore. <laughs> He's the kind of individual who knows where those people are, uh, that leadership. But, I mean, he, he has proposed certain things that haven't gone down well down, down the street here in the early days because they didn't fit the model. So I think we have to change the model. If you want to know where the money is for the consultancies, you have it. To, the question is, has there been any effort to study what keeps a multi-ethnic, uh, pluralistic society together? That's what all the money is down on the beltway there right now. Conflict resolution, ethnicity, how you interpret Moynihan's book on pandemonium. Uh, Stephen Solars, who was supposed to be, who was up for our ambassador in India, didn't quite make it, now just set up a new think tank down in Washington to study just that issue. The Carter Center is involved in it, and uh, Brookings and many other places. Uh, the question was, what percentage of the population is affected by AIDS? Prior to April 6th, so that's when there was not massive bloodletting in the literal sense. They said that 30 percent of the women of childbearing age in the cities, Kigali, uh, Kigali, Butare, Bujumbura, maybe one or two other cities, were HIV positive. It is, uh, it, that is not really the immediate problem. But that is a problem that is probably far worse now than it was on April 6th. And that is going to be a future terror 
in those two countries in that part of the world, from Uganda, Tanzania. Remember, you have 500,000 Rwandans living in Tanzania who came as refugees. You can probably take 30% of those people in a sexually active state who probably have AIDS now. Because even if they were trying to use prophylactics when they were in Rwanda, they're not available in the refugee camp. So this is going to be a terrible problem for the future. Maybe the more important issue for Rwanda, in addition to this confused ethnicity question, is the question of land. There was such pressure on land. And now that issue is what you're going to read about six months from now. And the reason is that those refugee flows I talked about from 1959 and 62, et cetera, et cetera, sent people out of the country to Uganda, Tanzania, Zaire, sometimes to Burundi, out of Rwanda. People came and took the land that those people owned. So your plot of a half a hectare, an acre, now is my plot. Now you've come back as the, the Tutsi party that has won the election. You come back from Burundi, come back from Uganda. You're on that plot. I say, that was my father's plot. And here's the deed. Now, I'm in, I happen to be a Tutsi with the government who just won the war. What's going to happen? It was very interesting. The, when I was in um, uh, Rwanda, I was in a particular southern town, and the whole government came down to address the people. And uh, they got in the stadium, and the president, and the prime minister, and Kagame, the minister of defense, who was kind of the power behind the throne, got up and made their speech. And then the people filed out to ask the questions. The first two questions came from women. The first question was land. They said, as women in this society, we are not allowed to hold a title to the land. Now I've come back from the refugee camp in Zaire, and I find that there is a Tutsi on my land. He claims that it was his father's land. I don't have anything to hold title because I'm my, fa my husband was killed. What do I do, Mr. President? And he didn't have a good answer for her. So that's the issues you're going to see over the next few years stimulating uh, trouble. OK, uh, there are those who have done the DNA tests to try to, I guess, DNA tests can tell you what race you are. They find no distinction. There are Tutsis who are that high. And there are Hutus that are six foot eight with aquiline noses. So the question of whether there's any real distinction, I think is very much up for debate, whether there's a distinction between Hutus and Tutsis. It seems to me that it was an issue of the way you were, uh, the way you grew up. If you, were, if you took care of the cows, then you had the best diet. If you were also the monarchy that reinforced your diet, and you may have grown in a different way. I don't know, I'm not a geneticist, but there is quite a bit of debate about this. And the, the current anthropological thinking is that there's no genetic difference between the two. The question is, is there a, a, an economic difference between Hutus and Tutsis? In Burundi, the Tutsis, both Burundi Tutsis and Tutsis who were refugees from Rwanda, over the last 30 years have dominated the economy. In Rwanda, the Tutsis are, are pretty well off, but uh, the Hutus have moved into the uh, power spots. The, the stratification of Tutsi, Hutu, Twa was an economic one. The Tutsis of the monarchy, and they controlled everything. The new monarchy ran the smuggling of things, ran uh, the gas stations. These are small little cities. And in Burundi, you can't find any, any store or any major shop that is not owned by a Tutsi. 
In Rwanda, the same is true basically of the Hutus. The question is, was the murder performed by locals or visiting murderers? The two presidents were shot down on the plane on uh, three, what was it? I'm not sure what time of the day it was. But within 12 hours in Rwanda, a whole series of people who were, were killed. And it is quite obvious to our people who knew all these people who were killed that they were on a list. It was the plane will be shot down, and the first person to be killed will be the Minister of Social Welfare. The next will be the Prime Minister, and they just went house by house. The militia, or in Rwanda now, the interhomwe, I forget what, what the term uh, means, were existing in most communities. You had a couple of kids who the government used to fuel uh, and finance, and they would drill a little bit, and this had been going on for a couple of years. They were getting ready for the takeover, the Hutu takeover. But it was only a few kids, stirred up by the radio, financed by the government. Those kids knew everybody. And it seems in most of the main towns that it was very specific. In fact, as you drive from uh, up through, right up through the middle of Rwanda, you see one building completely blown apart. I mean, multi-story building, crash down, and uh, stores on either side of it untouched. I mean, they went in and they blew apart Tutsi stores or Hutu stores. They were very specific. So there seems to have been a plan. But somebody else will be able to document that. Any intermarriage? Yes, that's the problem. <laughs> the, the problem in the sense of saying that you are a Hutu. All right, so Frank is a Tutsi. He's married to a Hutu woman. What are the kids? This is the, the problem. They're Tutsi. Catholic, probably. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yes, there's an awful lot of intermarriage. That's why you can't see the facial distinctions that you saw. If you remember the movie King Solomon's Mines with Stuart Granger, oldie. That's about the Tutsi kings. And that's the classic view of a Tutsi. Very stately, tall, about six foot four, six foot five, aquiline nose, proud, dignified. Tutsi king, Genwe, is what the Burundians call them. But now it's all mixed up. So you can buy your citizenship, or you could buy your citizenship. You've married with Hutus and Tutsis. It's very mixed up. And so to classify everything so simplistically as Hutus, Tutsis, doesn't go. The murders, in the murders, there were many mistakes. That's pretty well proven. The question is, what percentage of uh, Catholic Relief Service's budget is private and what comes from public sources? About 65% of our money, in terms of U.S. government contracts, our European Union contracts or UN contracts come from public sources, 65%. And the rest is from private sources. So for instance, in Rwanda, since we had been there for so long and we had such an apparatus, we were able to raise an awful lot of money. We must have raised, we're not exactly sure, but I'd say in the range of $10 million for Rwanda, Burundi, that complex. Mark, uh, what's his name? The fellow from The Sun who does their foreign stuff went out and traveled with our people in, in April uh, and he was filing stories uh, from our fax machine. So uh, we raised an awful lot of private money for those emergencies. And that, those kind of funds that are raised for emergencies go to the areas that they're designated. So they don't pay my salary, for instance. The question is, is the United Nations doing anything about the problems in Rwanda and Burundi? Yes, the United Nations is doing quite a lot. You have the different agencies of the United Nations. You have the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. They are controlling the flow 
of refugees. They make the policy decisions related to whether refugees should be pushed back into Rwanda or whether they will remain in uh, Zaire or Tanzania. They deal with the issues of um, protection of refugees, so they will put forces in there. And they guided the U.S. troops on those issues as far as protection. As far as assistance to refugees, that's normally done by private agencies. So the Catholic Relief Services, the CARE, the Save the Children. Prior to uh, April 6th, there were only about three American agencies operating in, in Rwanda. To be, I think it was CARE, AfriCare, oh, there were four. CARE, AfriCare, Seventh-day Adventists, and Catholic Relief Services. I think the last list I saw was 180. So the private agencies work with the UN, and the UN has other programs too, UNICEF, uh, but each has their own level of competence and skill. Ordinarily, those agencies that rush in during the disaster, it's like a salesman. You know your territory if you're there before. You know who's doing what and then you spell, spend money more efficiently and effectively. So the, the agencies and the UN groups that rush in oftentimes have difficulty starting up. The that is the number that's published in Money Magazine and the number we like to promote because it shows <laughs> some degree of efficiency. Yes. You know, and coming down here to Baltimore helped that. Uh, we are more efficient operating here in, in uh, Baltimore than we were in New York City. Uh, even with factoring in all the uh, the um, the cost of moving down and everywhere else, have you ever worked in New York City? <laughs> the the funny thing is, you know, people would come in on the subway, secretaries, even uh, managers, and you know they're frazzled, and they can't get to their desk in the morning to to do anything. They got to calm down. They're traumatized. Here in Baltimore, they come in and people are happy. And <laughs> Thank you. I, I was going to ask one more question before. <laughs> but I, I felt obliged to at least state. I, I was interested in your, your comment about needing a new paradigm. At one of our, our uh, student conferences here in the first two weeks of the Clinton administration, um, the speaker who was then a senior member of the policy planning staff said, we need a new paradigm, we have to get rid of Morgenthau. <laughs> and uh, Morgenthau, of course, his classic text is politics among nations. And the problem you're talking about is not a nation, it's on a different level. And so I, I thought perhaps that's apples and oranges in terms of a paradigm. And I probably wouldn't have, and you can certainly respond <laughs> if you wish to that. Um, having studied under Professor Morgenthau years ago, uh, uh, and he's a grand old figure within uh, the profession and, and probably the dominant figure for a generation and a half. But I do think his, the teaching was essentially the teaching of international statecraft which is very, very different from the types of problems you present. And the only reason I, I raise it is because the administration today, to the extent to which some of its members want a different paradigm, have raised a, a very, very elementary and serious question about international politics and its, and its practice. But I didn't think that was what you intended to raise at all. I didn't think so. And uh, with that said, <laughs> um, it's been a marvelous evening. I think this is a, I've always been impressed by the CRS people, and they do have a hands-on uh, quality and a deep passion as well as an awareness of, of the areas in which they work. And it is very different from the statesman's detached and abstract view. And it's a very earthy uh, approach to the problem. And I think the thing that has always impressed me most is the genuine humanitarianism that's within the service and its, its efforts. We've had, uh, and uh, Mr. Hackett is, is I sh should mention, also a member of our Board of Trustees now here at the Council. Uh, so two weeks in a row, we've had not only Catholic Relief Service people, but 
members of our board of trustees uh, addressing the council. Uh, I think all of us are very, very impressed uh, by you and Ambassador Pizzullo, and we feel educated, I know, uh, by tonight's presentation, and for that we thank you enormously. It's been a grand evening. <laughs>